Well, uh, amen. Well, I mean, look at these, the guitar. I mean, I don't know what to say about that. That was incredible. I wish I could do that myself. Uh, please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. You know, I'm very excited to be preaching the word. Amen. Marhaban esmi, Jonathan. It's Arabic. Welcome. My name is Jonathan. It's very exciting to be here again to preach the word to you. And uh, we're going to do a little study on Luke chapter 13. I preached this yesterday at ICCM. So for the ICCM students, you get a, a little second chance here to take notes for your exam. Amen. Let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful to be here tonight. God, so grateful, God, to be in your house. God, I pray, God, that you move me aside. God, I pray, God, that it is not my words that I speak, God, but you speaking through me. God, I pray, God, that uh, your word can cut our hearts. God, that each and every one of us can leave here with the, with the heart to change, the heart to be closer to you. God, I pray, God, that we can put all the nonsense of the world outside of this building and focus right here on you. God, we love you so much. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of my sermon is, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Luke chapter 13, let's jump right into it. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. All of our reading is uh, going to come from uh, Luke chapter 13. We're, in fact, going to read the entire chapter. Oh, my gosh. And we're going to have some supporting scriptures, <laughs> which I think will be incredible. Point number one is time is running out. Time is running out. Luke 13, verse 1. It says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think... They were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem. I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he, called, he, so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it it down. Time is running out. You know, this is a very, very powerful, intense couple of verses here. Yeah. You see, you, you get Jesus who basically says, hey, let me just distinguish something here. Let me tell you a story. Do you think these Galileans are worse sinners than those Galileans because of this? These, these sacrifices mixed with blood, with their own blood. No. But unless you repent, you too will perish. And then you get this tower that fall, and Salome that falls on these 18 people. He says, do you think that they're worse sinners? No. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Now, this is very applicable to us today. That if we do not repent, we too will perish. Don't worry, this won't be a repent or perish lesson. But the beginning kind of is, I guess. Amen. You know, but it, it, it's just very powerful because then he goes into this parable about this fig tree. Now, you know, of course, uh, this, this parable uh, is a little foreshadowing from Mark 11. If you remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree for not having any fruit on it. Right? You guys remember that? Yeah. Mark 11:22. 22. 
Now, it's cool because he says, hey, this, this fig tree didn't have any fruit. And he says, hey, cut it down. It's not bearing any fruit. And then this guy says, hey, like, well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll dig around it. I'll, I'll fertilize it. And then if it grows, fine. If it grows fruit, fine. But if not, we'll cut it down. Now, what this passage, what Jesus is symbolizing here is what's this fig tree? Well, this is the old covenant. Now, this old covenant, what happened is in the Old Testament, old covenant, it did not bear fruit. And so Jesus said, hey, it's time to cut it down. And Jesus, what did he try to do? He tried to get the Pharisees, the Jews, to repent. And most of them didn't. A lot of them didn't. Cut it down. There's this, uh, there's this uh, famous plant. I, I didn't know it was famous until uh, I was researching this lesson here. Uh, and I Googled it, and it was actually a famous plant. Uh, it's, this, it's called this Hampton Court Vine. And so it's in London. It's a 250-year-old grapevine, 250 years old. This thing basically from where the root begins to the end of where the furthest uh, cluster of grapes is 200 feet away. Wow. It's long. This, this grapevine produces 800 pounds of grapes every single year. Wow. 800 pounds of grapes. Now, there's this, uh, this uh, lady by the name of Jillian Cox. Uh, she's the gardener, uh, at least about 10 years ago she, she was. And she, in an interview, she said, if I do not take care of this plant, in two years it'll die. Wow. Two years. And so this plant needs constant tending and mending and growing uh, and, and to fertilize it so that way it will stay alive and keep growing. What is the fertilizer that's needed in our lives? It's the blood of Jesus. What helps us grow? What do we need to be fertilized and to grow and to be spiritual? It's the blood of Jesus. That, that's what symbolizes the new covenant. That when Jesus came and died for us, that is a new covenant that we are all entering into. But many rejected it. And many today still do. Now this is very powerful. If you uh, remember uh, in Titus chapter 2 verse 14, it says, Jesus says, who gave himself for us to redeem us. It's Paul talking about uh, Jesus here. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You know, this is very powerful because when you, when you come into a relationship with Jesus, you're eager to do what is good. Yeah. Why? Why do you think that is? You can, you can answer. Grateful. Grateful. Love. Love? Yeah. Well, because when Jesus comes and he dies for you and you realize what you've been saved from, you are excited and you're eager to change and to live for him also. You see, the blood of Jesus should fertilize you into a different person. It should maintain you and you should grow. In John 15, you guys are all familiar with this passage. It uh, talks about how we need to be a part of the vine, right? The vine being uh, Jesus, right? And that if we're not a part of the vine, it says that it, God cuts it off. And then it prunes those who are a part of the vine, those connected to Jesus. Now, you understand that if you have an apple tree, it's going to make apples. Good. You guys, are, you guys are good. A lemon tree. Lemons. Lemons. Cherries? Cherries? Making sure. Disciples? Disciples. Disciples make disciples. Now, basically, in John 15, it's if you're not making disciples, it says you're going to be cut off. Cut it off. If you're not a part of the vine connected to Jesus. John 15 is a fruit of making disciples. There's another fruit uh, in Galatians 5 called fruits of the spirit. These are things that, that come out of you, right? You have the spirit inside you, things that you are growing in, your character, growing as a Christian. Uh, what are some of the fruits of the spirit? There, there's nine of them. Ah, someone was at ICCM yesterday. Look at that. That's good. Brianna knows this. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, gent uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine fruits of the Spirit. 
This is another one of the things that we got to be growing in, is that we have to be growing in our character, who we are as disciples, as men and women of God. Another one comes from Psalm 128. This is fruit of your labor. It says, blessed are the, all those, are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. You know, this is basically just getting stuff done. Going after just getting it done. Working for the Lord. You know, of course, we talked about this. Disciples make disciples. We don't make atheists. We don't make agnostics. We don't make Muslims or Mormons. We make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple makes, right? Now, uh, it was cool. Uh, Keanu and I went to Vegas. I shared about this uh, a couple weeks ago. We went to Vegas to uh, visit uh, Keanu's mom and sister. And then my mom flew from Arizona, and we all hung out in the same house. It was, it was a lot of fun. My mom is uh, she's amazing. She makes me laugh. She, she likes to roast me. You guys know I like to, I like to roast people. Uh, it's just what I do. Uh, I, I might roast you, some of you in the sermon later. Uh, I'll just look around and see who's the least fired up, and I'm going to roast that person. So it just, it's coming. It's coming. But my, I get it from my mom, right? She's, she's, she's the reason, because she'll, she'll roast me all day long, and it's just funny, you know? Uh, but amen, that has nothing to do with the lesson. My, uh, my, uh, my wife and I were in Vegas, and this is really cool because Vegas, I, I, I've, never, I've been to Vegas once, uh, and, and, you know, I played uh, uh, blackjack for a while, won some money. I think I won like 600 bucks, which is fire. It was awesome. Uh, I didn't gamble when I went out there this last time. I just uh, hung out and relaxed uh, sometimes. We had like six kids at one point. I don't know how we had six kids, but uh, amen. <laughs> But in Vegas, they have all these replica places. They got a, a replica New York. They got a replica Pyramid. They got a replica Eiffel Tower. They got a replica Michael Jordan walking down the street, replica Elvis, like all these different things, right? And what's cool about, I was thinking about like impersonators. So if someone wants to be like Elvis, they're going to study it, right? You, you got regular Elvis. You got black Elvis. You got to see them. You got Korean Elvis. Uh, you have all these different people. And although they may not have the same color of skin, our background, they start, they, try, they start talking like them, right? I'm not going to do it. Um, I almost did. I almost did. I almost did. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Uh, it'd be, uh, I, I, won't, I won't be able to let that down. You guys are roast me. Um, but anyways, what happens is, is when you have someone who wants to do this, they want to make money. Right? That's the purpose, right? They want to make money. So they want to be good at what they do. So what do they do? They practice. And so when you see this person one year, you're like, okay, this is cool. But then in three years, you expect this person to be better, to be more skilled. The same should be said about a disciple of Jesus. That who are we trying to be like? Christ. And so if we're the same person yesterday, a year ago, a month ago, something is wrong. Because every single day, we should strive to be more like Jesus. This is the fruit of our character changing, of us being different. Now, this is where it gets a little scary from this passage here. Is that oftentimes what happens is we think people fall away when in fact it could be God just cutting them off. Wow. Where people just leave the church and we're like, wait, why did they leave? Oh, they were so awesome and fired up. But they weren't making disciples. They weren't growing as a disciple. They weren't changing. In fact, they actually looked way more not like. Help me out. Aquia, help me out. They look less like uh, Jesus a year ago than they do now. They look less like Jesus now than they did a year ago. That's a sentence right there. That's what it is. And you're like, wait a second. How is that possible? And they have no labor. They don't work. They're lazy. And God says, cut it down. You know, it, it's a very scary thing when you think about it, because we understand that God's heart is for all men to be saved. But when we look at the scriptures, if we're just wasting soil, God says, cut it down. It's powerful. You know, one of uh, when you think about some of your biggest fears, mine is roaches, flying cockroaches, is mine. You know, I, I had this. Uh, I had this traumatic experience when I, I'll tell you guys a story. When I was around, uh, I think like eight or nine, uh, maybe, maybe I was seven actually. It was right before I moved to Fresno. 
I, I, we had this two-story like condominium, and then my, uh, my aunt was living with us at the time. And so we, were all, we, we all went out to eat as a family, and so she decided that she wanted to do her laundry. And so instead of throwing all of uh, our family's clothes in a dryer, she threw them on the floor. I think she was probably like 18, 19 at the time, so she was young. Amen. So what happened is, if you know, when water is on the ground, it attracts bugs. All kind of creatures and all kind of stuff. So I got upstairs, and lo and behold, I was taxed with the job of putting all that stuff in, uh, back in the washer. And I was like, okay, come on. Seven years old, you know. And so I lifted up one item of clothing. And this, and this is in Eugene, Oregon. And, and this enormous roach the size of a chihuahua. It didn't, it didn't run away from me. It didn't run. It, it was like a hissing cockroach, the ones that fly. It was crazy. It didn't run away. It charged me. I was seven. And it ran up my leg. <laughs> That's serious. It's a true story. I stripped off all my clothes right on down to my Spider-Man underwear, and I was running and screaming. I, I was freaking out, and I never found that roach. I don't know where it went. It was just gone. I just freaked out, and I couldn't find it. I, I, it was probably in my clothes. I just left. So, Mom, I can't do it. Ever since then, I've, been, uh, I've had a phobia of roaches ever since then. That, that's that's my, one of my biggest fears is roaches. I also dislike airplanes. One of my favorite stories to tell was uh, I flew Spirit, which for the first time. Yeah. I flew it once, and it was the last time I've flown it since. At first, at first, I, at first I, got the fly, I had to fly to Arizona. It's when I first moved to New York back in 2016. I had to fly back in August uh, to go to court for my, my oldest son. And basically, I, uh, I, I flew Spirit. I was like, wow, this ticket's like 80 bucks from New York to Arizona. This is crazy. And it was, it was like three, three stops. Huh, okay. Now, the worst part of an airplane to me is the takeoff and the landing or the turbulence, all, all that part, everything. I don't like airplanes because for me, I like to be able to control what's happening. I don't like boats. I don't like airplanes. I don't like it if I'm not driving because I, I feel like I can control the car. Do you know what I mean? I just like to, you know, I like to be able to, I like to be able to just like, I'm on a plane. I want to just be able to hop out and get on solid ground. You know what I mean? On an airplane, there's just like, you're just at the mercy of the Lord at that point. You know what I mean? You have no idea. The plane's jumping. Kids are screaming and crying. I'm just like, oh gosh, this is it. Uh, okay. Anyway, so I'm on this airplane and I, I'm in the middle seat on spirit. I'm six foot four uncomfortable. So it's the first flight. This is like the first one leaving New York and we're going to go land in like someplace in Florida. Uh, and, and then the plane takes off and I'm just like, hey amen. So I'm sitting there, a little rocky. Okay, we're chilling. I have one lady on my left who I, uh, doesn't speak English. And I have another uh, gentleman on my right who doesn't speak English. Uh, and so I'm like, hey amen. They're both talking in a language. I'm not sure what, what it is. And so we, uh, we're, the plane's taking off. And I'm sitting there, you know, like I do my, my thing. I have my arms. And they both have their arms on the armrest. I'm like, oh, gosh. So I'm like, you know, like sitting in this weird position. My, my, my knees are like all like twisted and stuff. And I'm like, amen. And so I, the plane takes off. And it's, it's, it, after about 10, 15 minutes, I'm like, okay, we're good. We're in the air. And then it just goes. And I was just like, what in the world? And so I just reached and I grabbed the armrest. And I'm squeezing as hard as I can. I'm freaking out. And then it keeps going. And it dips and dips. And I'm holding on. And then, and then it calms down, and then I look, and I'm squeezing the guy's leg next to me. And I was like, oh, 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 sorry. And he was like, oh, oh, oh. you know what I mean? And I was like, I was like, amen, dude. But we didn't, he didn't speak English, so he didn't get to tell me. I'm sure he, that was a good laugh for him. But the point is, is like that, those are sometimes legitimate fears for us are some of those small things. But this is a big fear right here. Imagine God just cutting you off. You just wake up one day and you're like, you know what? I don't believe in God anymore. You know what? I, I just, I don't want to do this anymore. 
Like, but it's not, and we think they're falling away. But God could be clipping you and taking you out because you are wasting soil. Time is running out. You see, for us, there needs to be a sense of urgency when it comes to following Jesus. Being urgent to change, urgent to grow, urgent to make disciples. This is not me. This is in the Bible. So you think like, oh, wow, being a disciple sounds intense. Sounds hard. It sounds like a lot. Point number two. In time, the kingdom changes the world. In time, the kingdom changes the world. Let's get back to Luke 13. Look at verse 10. It says on a, on verse 10 of Luke 13, it says, On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Uh, she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called, for her, he called her forward, and he said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on, his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Uh, indignant, because, of, uh, because Jesus healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman... A daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. We'll stop right there. You know, this is really incredible because you see, obviously, Jesus did a lot of stuff on the Sabbath. And of course, if you research the Sabbath, you understand that Jesus, of course, came to fulfill the Old Testament, right? The Old Covenant. He didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. And the Sabbath, of course, was fulfilled through Jesus. And a lot of that, what was happening in the Old Covenant, they were taking advantage of the laws. They were taking advantage of even some of the scriptures. And some people do that still today. It's very scary. But Jesus, he, he, he points something out that's, that's rather interesting. You know, he, one, of course, it's always funny when you see Jesus says, you hypocrites. I, I always wonder, like, how, what was Jesus' tone? You know what I mean? Was it like a, oh, you hypocrites? Was it like a, you hypocrites? You know what I mean? Like, what was it? It's an exclamation point here, so maybe it was, you hypocrites. I don't know. <laughs> but it's interesting because the, the Pharisees, they missed the miracle. She was healed for 18 years. She was making her way down to the synagogue for 18 years, crippled. And they had to have known her. The synagogue leader came out. I'm sure he knew her. And then he, Jesus approaches her, he heals her, and she's healed. And they don't even care. They're like, come and be healed on the other six days. Do not come on the day off. Wow. What? 18 years, a miracle, and hey, no, you come on the other six days. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, it's really cool when people get angry that you're working on your day off. That's kind of cool, huh? Jesus is working on his day off, and they're mad at him. Like, what are you doing? He's like, hey, well, you, you guys work on your day off also. You go and water your ox and your donkey, you hypocrites. You know, uh, this woman oftentimes is overlooked is that once she didn't come to Jesus to be healed, Jesus went to her. It's, it's, it's only a few cases in the Bible where Jesus actually approached someone else, approached the person to heal them, versus they were going to look for Jesus. This is very powerful. Nothing happens by chance. But it's really cool because in this situation, they, Jesus corrects them, and it says they get humiliated. All of his opponents, they were humiliated. That comes from pride. You see, when we get corrected, we typically have two responses, humility or pride. Someone says, hey, you know what? You really need to change. You shut down. You get angry. You get bitter. You're like, oh, no. Yeah. It's <laughs> my Luke impression. Ah, you know what I mean? That's a Pharisee. It's a Pharisee mindset. God corrects those he loves, disciplines those he loves. 
How does he discipline us? Oftentimes it's through life. It's even through our leaders that God may show us discipline. You know, God puts leaders in our lives to train us, to mold us, to teach us, to correct us, to rebuke us. It's very biblical. But then there's the other side of it to respond in humility, right? Someone corrects you and you get humble. It hurts, right? Here's the thing. When someone corrects you, I've never seen someone say, get corrected immediately and say, wow, bro, thank you so, so much. You know, that was awesome. I, uh... Wow, dude, like I, my life is just so, you know what I mean? I have no, I've never seen that, not once. Even in me, I've never done that. I've never just said, hey, bro, thank you so much. I appreciate you telling me that I'm just terrible, you know what I mean, or whatever. <laughs> I've never seen it. But here's the thing, like, it, there's times where it does hurt. Most of the time when, you're, when you see it and you see the scriptures, you're like, wow. See, when you come to Jesus, there's a brokenness. Yeah. You know, when people responded to Jesus, it says they were cut to the heart. There's a brokenness, a sadness, a remorse, a godly sorrow to change. That's humility. And it may hurt and it feels painful. But then once you get through it, you realize like, wow, this brother really cares for me. That he was willing, because here's the thing, calling someone out on their sins is not easy either. You got to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and say, hey, bro, now I really got to talk to you about something here. And you don't know how they're going to respond. There could, there could, it could be a blow up. It could be, you know what, I'm out. It, you don't know what's going to happen. Now, if you know me, I, I don't really care. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call it out. I, I love you all, so I speak the truth. That's just my, my nature, right? I don't really have a problem with telling you guys the truth. But uh, sometimes I, uh, my wife is helping me to... You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain it. Loving, gentle, I don't know. I don't know. Less edgy. Less edgy. There you go. Thank you. It's good to uh, have a wife. You know, when I, uh, back in uh, 2019, I was diagnosed with uh, this uh, heart condition uh, at 28 years old. And I remember going to the, to the ER because I, I was having a hard time breathing, right? And then my, my, I was sitting down and my chest was, it just felt like I was racing. It was just like pounding and it was burning, like it was all burning. And my arm, my left arm was getting tingly. And I was like, oh, snap, what in the world? And I, I sat there for a couple of days and I was like, whatever. And then it just kept getting worse and worse. And then I just started having like a, I was panicking. It was getting worse and worse, you know? So I went to the urgent care, and they're like, oh, everything looks fine. And I was like, amen. So I went home, and it just got worse, and it got worse. And I was just like, man, I was just like, this is a lot. So I went to the ER. And, you know, obviously we were there for a while. I was in Connecticut. And they did an ultrasound on my heart, right? And then the guy says, the, the ER doctor, he walks up to me. He, he's doing it. He, they're kind of whispering back and forth. And I'm just kind of like, hey, uh, what's going on? You know what I mean? Like, let, let's, they're talking, and, you know, very lightly. And then he comes over, and he goes, hey, you had a heart attack. And I was like, I had what? <laughs> I was like, hey, I- I'm 28. Yeah, you had a heart attack. The damage around your heart is exactly what a heart attack looks like. And I was like, hmm. I called Luke. I said, hey, bro, I, had a- <gasps> I just started weeping. And I, I, my wife was pregnant with my daughter. And then... Uh, I had Jonah, and of course I had my oldest son, Carter. And all I could think about was my wife and kids. And I just told Luke, I was like, what's going to happen to my wife, my kids? And then uh, he said, well, bro, your wife will get remarried. (laughs) You'll You'll go to heaven. Your wife will get remarried, and she'll be taken care of. I said, bro, that's not really what I want to hear right now. <laughs> I could die right now, you know? Luke is very logical. But, bro, to be awesome, you'll go to heaven. And what your kids will be taken care of. And this was, this was a very real thing for me. 
And it ended up not being a heart attack. I was in the hospital for about four or five days. I was on a bunch of medication, shots, blood thinners, all kind of stuff, because they were afraid I was going to get a blood clot and actually have a heart attack, because my, my heart had so much damage on it. But it basically came from this thing called, a, I had a severe case of myocarditis, and it hospitalized me three times. That was the first of three times. Um, and basically, they, they thought I had COVID, and I just had a severe case. I just reacted, because COVID actually was causing myocarditis, and even the vaccine for or, or some people were causing it. And then so I, uh, I uh, basically, they said, well, this looked like it was COVID. I tested negative for everything. Uh, and then they said I could have just got a bug bite. Like a bug with a viral infection bit me, possibly, and that's how I got it. They, they, there's, there's basically, it was... <laughs> My, uh, my, ar my, my arch nemesis, nemesis came full circle. Oh, oh, God. Oh, my goodness. What? Why, why you got to do that, bro? Well, looks like we found who we're roasting today. Just kidding. You know, but I, while I was in the hospital, it was really cool. Like, I, I still went to church. Yeah. I, I, we were all virtual. It was COVID. I still went to church. I went to staff meeting. I was getting ready. They were prepping me for an MRI, and I was on staff, and I was like, oh, I got to go. You know what I mean? Like, I, I got to get out of here. And then uh, I got hospitalized uh, again a second time. And I didn't just go to church, but I preached. Yeah. Why? Because I love the kingdom. I love the church. I, I love God's kingdom. It's incredible. Why? Because I believe it will change the world. Yeah. I believe if everyone obeyed the Bible, the world would be perfect. Yeah. Everything would be awesome. Yeah. And I believe the kingdom, the buzzard agrees, that the kingdom yeah. is precious and incredible. There's a brother, you guys, are, you guys remember uh, uh, Wilfredo. Uh, he was baptized here uh, uh, a few months ago. Him and Tim were baptized the same day. And then it was cool because uh, shortly after, Wilfredo, he had to go to Ireland uh, for, to study abroad. And so he hasn't been able to really go to church because they have a strict policy. Hey, because of COVID, you can't travel on the plane to go to London. And so they lifted the ban, and the first thing he did was fly to London and go to church. So he flew from Ireland to London to go to church. It was incredible. And then I was talking to some of the brothers, like, oh, yeah, he's going on a date with this sister right now. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. You see, when the kingdom is valuable... You go to it. Yeah. And now here's the thing. The kingdom will inconvenience you. Like, let's be honest here. But what will you do to actually be a part of it? To be there, to be present, to see how the kingdom will change the world. And that's what missions is all about. You know, it's cool. I was talking with, uh, with Daniel, and I asked him to share for communion. Because uh, uh, the reality is, is... Uh, I, I, uh, I told my wife this. I, I will tell you guys. Uh, amen. Uh, she probably is not going to. Uh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to say it, babe. I 100% believe I'm moving to the Middle East. 100%. No one's asked me, so don't worry. I'm not, I'm not letting you sit in stone. But I just believe I'm going. Why? Because I'm willing to. I'm just like, hey, amen. I'm going to go. And they need Jesus too. There's a lot of disciples in New York. You guys will be fine. But the Middle East, they, they need Jesus. We have one church in the Middle East. One. They need Jesus. And this is a very, this is a very real thing. Because I'm going to take my three kids, my, my fourth child is due uh, in June, and I'm like, hey, let's go. And my wife and I, we've counted the cost. And we're willing to go. Why? Because I believe in what the church and what Jesus and the kingdom is all about. You know what? Uh, this lady worked for 18 years to get down to the synagogue. And Jesus was there. And he healed her. Jesus can heal you, heal you also. You know, what it takes is commitment. The first thing you need is commitment. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. See, oftentimes we're waiting for the miracle when we need to commit first. We commit, and then God strengthens you. Then God gives you the power to overcome, but you commit. Now, here's the reality. We can't set limits on commitment. 
Oftentimes what happens is like, oh Lord, I'll commit to you for two years. Just please give me this. Right. Two years go, comes and goes. Yeah. This lady was committed for 18 years before she was healed. We, 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 we set these, these parameters on God and we limit his ability, his power, because we want it now. Oh, God, just really, really want that motorcycle. I'll commit for three years. Give you, I've given you my life for four years, God. Please, let me date this brother. Please, God, please let me be married. I've been faithful for seven years. I'm committed. I don't know if I could do it anymore, God. I've been committed for way too long. And you still haven't given me the desires of my heart. We set limits on God because we want it when we want it. Commitment with zero expectation that you'll get anything except your salvation. Why? Because God is enough. The issue is, is that some of us are just too strong for the kingdom. What do I mean by that? The Bible, we as a, or as a church, we sometimes will throw around, oh, I feel overwhelmed. There's a lot going on. But the more accurate word is probably weak. You have a lot going on and you feel weak. But God strengthens the weak. Right? Those of us who yeah. seek advice, those of us who pray, who read our Bibles, God strengthens us. Yeah. What happens is, when I say that you're too strong for the kingdom, is what happens is you're like, you know, I don't need to read. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to pray. I'm good. You're too strong for the kingdom. You see, you need to be weak spiritually to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about weak in a worldly way where you're just sending it up. I'm talking about weak as, you know what, I need Jesus to get through. Yeah. If I don't pray today, ah, man, I'm not going to make it. I need this prayer to get through. If I don't read my Bible every day, well, I'm not going to be fed. I'm not going to be ready. I need God to make it through this Bible study and this day. I need God to help me get through my thoughts and my brain and all the world trying to pull me left to right. I need Jesus. You know, coming from someone who has mental health, I need Jesus. It's super important. In Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 10, verse 4, I read it this morning when I was reading my Bible. It says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. You see, the issue is we just need to humble out, accept our weakness, and then God will strengthen you. He will strengthen us. Let's get back to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, verse 18, it says, Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in all of its branches. Again, he asked, What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mix into the about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. We'll stop right there. Now, this is really cool. Luke uses all these different uh, literary devices of balance throughout his book. They're basically like man and woman. It's the whole world, right? A uh, large batch of dough here, the whole world. The yeast is the kingdom. And so it says that this yeast, it will work itself through the entire batch of dough. The kingdom of God will work itself through the entire world. That Jesus will make it to around the entire world. All nations will hear Jesus. You know, there was a time where uh, in 2017, I came out of the ministry. My wife and I weren't, weren't doing too good in our marriage. When we first got married, it was, a lot of it was my mental health. And it took me a lot. I had to go to therapy. I wanted to go to therapy. And I needed to go. And I had to really learn how to master my mental health. Because it was, it was definitely damaging our marriage. But then I, I let, we, we came out of the ministry we were let go and told, hey, let's just focus on your mental health and, 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 and your ministry, and then we'll talk about a plan in the future. And so I, I started working for Apple. Now, Apple was probably, hands down, my uh, favorite job to work at. It was really fun. 
Uh, I made a lot of good money. Uh, most people get promotions uh, average. Uh, there's people who worked there who worked there for five years and got one promotion that fifth year. It was intense. I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. I got two promotions in 10 months. I just worked hard. It's just natural, right? And, and, and that's just what it is. And I, was, I fell away. I chose to walk away from God. Or I was cut off. Wow. And I, I, I went through and I worked. And then when I got restored and I came back to God, uh, I, I didn't want to go back into the ministry. I was like, no. Like Luke, was like, Luke and Brandon were like, hey, like, you guys want to come back and get, get you guys ready to go back into the ministry? Because they've always believed that we were, we were ministry. And I, I've been told that I would be a preacher since I was like 14. And I was like, no, I'm good. You know, I'm making good money, and uh, I, I can make, I, I make six figures in probably like a year. Yeah, I'm good, comfortable. And we talked for a while, and Kiana was like, yeah, ministry, that's, yeah, she's all for it. And then he, uh, Luke says, you know, bro, you did not move all the way across the country to work at Apple. And it took me a minute, and I was like, yeah, you know, it's actually true. I, I, I'm neglecting my purpose. Some of us are called to be preachers, and we don't do it. Some of us are called to the ministry, and we neglect it. Uh, look in Acts, Acts chapter 16. We'll come back to uh, we'll come back to Luke. Acts 16. We're gonna move a little faster here. Don't worry. My third point is super quick. Okay, Acts 16. Now, what happened in my life is I lacked vision. My vision was gone. I, I, was, I had no direction. The only vision I had was let me get these dollars. That was it. Let me just provide for my family. I had career advancement. Uh, that's what I'm going to focus on. Acts chapter 16. Now, if you don't have a vision, I want to tell you that that's okay. You don't need one. Let me explain. Verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia, Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word to the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mys Mysia, uh, they tried to enter Bithynia. This is crazy. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Ma of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Who had the vision? Who answered the call? They all did. Paul had the vision, and they went. They concluded that we were called to preach the word in Macedonia. There are uh, two brothers I want to lift up here that uh, will be leaving the New York City Church to go on mission teams. One of them just got here, Alan Koreas. Alan's uh, father in the faith is uh, Blaze, who he uh, baptized him. And Blaze has asked for Alan to be on the mission team to plant Morocco in northern, wow. northern Africa. So come June, Alan will be on his way uh, to Morocco. And his answer was, here I am, send me. So very proud of you, bro. Another brother will be moving, staying in the United States, but moving all the way to California, to Santa Barbara. Malik Stith. <laughs> Malik was asked to move to Santa Barbara to help strengthen the church. Because obviously a lot of the disciples that plant that came on the, the mission team to New York, they came to plant, uh, to help out. They came from Santa Barbara. And so we were been asked to send some people to help strengthen the church in Santa Barbara. So uh, Malik, uh, Lord willing, will be heading to Santa Barbara. He's just to tidy up a few things with his classes. Uh, but be on a mission team to Santa Barbara. Both of these men realize 
that the kingdom of God is how we change the world. Yeah. It's not just about New York. It's like what Luke said. It's international. Yeah. We're all over the place. And there are needs to get the gospel. And if the question is, are you ready to go? Here I am. Send me. You know, uh, I had to realize that my business cards, my Apple T-shirts, my login at Apple, helping customers because they forgot their Apple ID password, Come on. would all burn. Wow. None of it would go to heaven. You know, the, the greatest basketball team in the world of all time is the uh, Los Angeles Lakers. How many, uh, how many rings Brooklyn got? Just kidding. I'm a huge Kobe fan. I grew up in L.A., so Kobe is, uh, is obviously, if you're from L.A., Kobe is a big deal. But what's powerful is understanding this. No matter what team you rep, Brooklyn, the Knicks, the Lakers, the Jets, Buffalo Bills, the Rangers, it doesn't matter. None of those jerseys will get you to heaven. Right. Only the jersey of a disciple will get you to heaven. Let's get back to Luke chapter 13. We'll, we'll close it out here. Luke 13. Luke 13. We're going to read just uh, the rest of Luke here. Verse 22. It gets a little intense, so you know, brace yourself. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. Verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will keep driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Jesus goes throughout these towns and he's teaching people. And these people are wondering, like, wow, who, how many of us will be saved? This is a legitimate question after Jesus is like, hey, you're going to be cut it down. Yeah. Well, how many will be saved? And he goes, many will not make it. But make every effort to go through the narrow door. How much effort are you making? The Bible says that what's bound on earth, we bound in heaven. The translation there is that whatever, if you're a part of the kingdom here on earth, the church, God's church, you are a part of the kingdom in heaven. You're written in the book of life. Very amazingly, uh, today, you will witness, will be baptized. Point number three, and this is super quick. I already read the scripture. Point number three is time to decide. At the end of the day, it's just a decision to make every effort. Now, I want to be completely real with you. When you choose to join the church of God, it is not sunshine and rainbows. 
It is not you get baptized and all of a sudden you hear angels singing. Or you see this bright light come down and, oh, Lord, and you're lifted up. It's not like that. It's glorious. You wake up and the feeling is real. But what's also real is the attacks that you are going to go through in a spiritual sense. That you will be attacked by evil forces. You will also be attacked by people who call you their brother and sister in the church. The Bible warns against these things. That there are wolves in the kingdom of God. That weeds will grow with the wheat. The issue is this. If you pull up the weeds, you will pull up the wheat also. It's very, I want you guys to grasp this concept here. We do have to make a decision, but you got to make a decision to be faithful to the end. It's not about just a decision to be a baptized disciple. It's about dying faithful. It's about making it to heaven. We always, uh, there's always this illustration that, uh, when uh, someone passes away faithful, a faithful disciple, that's one point for God. So I'm going to get baptized. Because even as a disciple, that person may not really be one. It's very real. There are people even in the kingdom, dare I say, will actually try to convince you not to be here. We've seen it. It happens all the time. And we, 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 as leaders, we do our best to protect you guys. But there are people who are duplicitous. They live two lives and are really good at it. The Bible warns against these as well. There was this, uh, this man in Phoenix uh, around 2009, 2010. Uh, it was a very sad story. His name is uh, Bill Secor. Very uplifting. Sorry. Name Bill Secor. Uh, he was uh, in the hospital towards the end of his life. And he started having nightmares. It was really just, just getting to him. And he reaches out to uh, uh, Neil Klopek. Uh, this is Chris Klopek's dad. And so Neil reaches out to his son who was leading the Phoenix Church at the time, Chris. And they go to the hospital because he, he was in fear. And they start studying the Bible with him. Start showing him the scriptures. Uh, one of my old mentors, Rob Bolton, used to go there and he used to read him scriptures, right? Because he couldn't, he couldn't move. He was, he was, he was ebbing away. And uh, he, he shared with Rob uh, as he was talking, he said, you know, this is my kingdom dream. And he says, you know, I, I want to get well enough to see church one time. To go to church just once. To see the kingdom. Bill Secor was baptized in 2009, 2010. But sadly, his kingdom dream was never realized. He passed away a few days after his baptism. But his heart was, I want to see it one time before I go. Because when you understand the kingdom, that the Old Testament literally points to the kingdom. Jesus came to die for our sins to get the church started. He died for it. The value of the church. See, the world distorts church. I'm not talking about world church here. I'm not talking about like the worldly aspect of church. I'm talking about God's aspect of church. Satan has two programs. He wants to beat you until you don't believe that there even, even is a God. He wants to beat you down, wear you out. Give you hardship and challenge until and so that way you don't even believe that God is even in existence. And the second thing is he wants to make you feel comfortable. That you don't even care to reach out to God. That life is just easy and great. That you've gotten everything that you've ever wanted. And then what's even worse is that he'll swap those two things. You have everything that's comfortable and it's awesome, and then he'll just take it all away and beat you down. And then he'll give you everything that you need and make you comfortable and then beat you down again. And we're stuck in that cycle. How do we get out of it? The blood of Jesus. Staying connected to Christ. You see, for us, we have the word of God. 
We have the very thing that we need to know the truth, commit to it, and obey it. And then we are set free. We are urgent because we know that time is short. And we understand it's time for us to decide. Let's go after all nations. Let us be visionaries as we follow the greatest God. Doing the greatest thing that we could ever do. Advancing the kingdom of God. Thank you so much.